Charnel House of the Moon by Thomas Ligotti Entranced hilarity was perhaps his first, but certainly not his only reaction, when from a hidden bed of shadows he gazed upon the place and its curious workings. He had journeyed far too far merely for that, and truly novel sensations were rare enough without diluting them in the swill of banal combinations. Much, much more, he had heard, awaited one who would go down from the moon's crystal-dusted mirror of dreams and travel to that flashy mound which stood out from the void like a chunk of fresh meat set redly within a diamond. There, they said with voices thin and fine as the air of imagination, you may roll your eyes in a living mirror and leave your lunar immunity to such things behind. It is our reflecting reservoir, so to speak, where a graveyard is sunk low into the muck. Oh, we envisage it endlessly in our cerebral exploits of the cosmic macabre. But go, go there if you must, and see. He did see after arduously strolling across a landscape colored in a rainbow of open wounds, radiant against the blackness that waits beyond the footlights of stark autopsies. With a little skip he leaped over streams, their translucence divided into a vain work of tributaries, viscous but still chuckling through crow-footed ruts. He was tempted to drink from these, never having refreshed himself with anything so palpable. But this was a minor delight, and he could save its savoring as a final consolation should his destination disappoint him in more ways than he could reasonably expect. And here at last, in truth, it was the distinguished thing. It seemed no more than a big box of boards soaring like a mountain where gleaming black clouds roil about the summit. It was cheaply buttressed at its base by long planks which leaned against the walls like unvigilant watchmen. Other comparisons he could easily have conjured but needed to conserve his imagination for the no doubt inspiring feast inside the amazing structure. He entered unseen amid darkness and confusion and sounds of labor. Entranced hilarity was perhaps his first, but certainly not his only reaction when from a hidden bed of shadows he gazed upon the place and its curious workings. Complex hybrids and crossbreeds of sentiments were born from each strange menage of mind, emotions, and senses. So this was what it was like to live outside the austere atmosphere of the lunar visionary, to, in fact, live at all in any proper sense of the word. The place, to put it plainly and without the evocations of vagueness, was, was something quite similar in principle to what a complete outsider's conception of a slaughterhouse might be. The beasts themselves did not make any audible sound, standing uniformly docile, cornered in fragile corrals. To his hearing, however, their very silence seemed a kind of music, a sterile harmony as pure as the white of their hides, the white lines of their elegant necks and glassy manes. And they all remained unspattered despite the gloomy filth that seemed to be everywhere, even rising from the ground as a gray ghost of steam. Marauding through the greasy haze were huge men who apparently were clad in nothing but long, black, rubbery aprons. Their faces were parodies of divinities of apes. They moved with graceless deliberation. His exact impression was more expansively articulated, as if they were being just adequately manipulated by powers in themselves more stealthy. Still, the pristinely pale creatures obeyed them without a struggle, 
glancing upward a little shyly at the last moment when the gory mallet came down and smashed them between the eyes, right below the spot where a spiraled horn projected from their sweatless foreheads. The gods, he imagined, had no uncertain use for such well-formed cornua. Without delay, the butchers separated these appendages from the fallen carcasses. They appeared to snap off easily, like icicles. He then watched the flaying of the carcasses and the hanging of the hides along the wall like old coats. What royal stoles these would make, he thought, for a monarch of the imagination. And the creature's meat was laid bare, an inner pink as perfect as their outer white. It was all so exciting, he gasped inwardly in the shadows. The ideal fare for one not accustomed to gross nourishment. But what a scandal the way the processing was handled, the way hooks came down from high above and brusquely lifted the pretty flesh into the blackness. Was there even a roof to this coliseum of butchery? Or did the eye glancing upward see far over the walls and deep into the old, old well of the abyss? His fair eyelashes fluttered with dreams and curiosity, a cornucopia of universal figures and fancy images. Then his reverie was brought to an end, quite crudely interrupted, and in tranced hilarity, leaping toward hysteria, was only a small part of what he felt. Well now, look what we got here, brothers, said one of the big boys in black apron, massaging his meaty and embristled cheeks in a fairy tale parody of thoughtfulness. The others gathered around, some carrying monstrous mallets and others caressing the blades of surgically sharp instruments. They chuckled unambiguously. They nodded. They whispered among themselves. A simple style is best now. They watched one of his pale, slender hands wipe something from his taut brow. He then stared at his open hand as though it's something he had never seen or imagined. And then he realized the sort of place he was in that the filthy glamour of it was just a disguise for another place which was without light or air, a jewel-hard darkness, a place he could never know in the way he really wanted. And he realized what was going to happen to him now. The massive figures hefted their tools, closing in. And he laughed a little, for at that moment entranced hilarity was not entirely absent from his perception of this pageant and the obscure but demanding role he was about to play.